As we look at the spiritual disciplines, uh, specifically those that are related to our spiritual growth directly, um, the Bible is the foundation of everything that we look at um, as we seek to understand how do we draw near to God. In doing so, we also um, have looked at several different areas, and tonight we turn our attention towards fasting. Fasting is one of those areas that a lot of people don't do. It's one of those areas that we tend to avoid. Um, And there's a plethora of reasons for that. We like our food. We like to eat. And I don't know that I can necessarily blame us. And when we look at this area of fasting, I think that um, John Wesley has it right when he said that some have exalted religious fasting beyond all scripture and reason, and others have utterly disregarded it. It would seem that most have utterly disregarded it. Many of us don't fast. It's not something that we do, and and it's one of those areas that it's like, okay, I know it's kind of there, but I don't know, do I really have to fast? So this evening, I would like us to take a look at that. Richard Foster, in his book, Celebration of Disciplines, says this about fasting. Why has the giving of money, for example, become unquestionable recognized as an element of Christian devotion and fasting so dis, um, disputed. Certainly, we have as much, if not more, evidence from the Bible for fasting as we do for giving. Perhaps in our affluent society, fasting involves a far larger sacrifice than the giving of money. I think that might hit some of why we tend to shy away from fasting. It, it's a lot to give up. You know, it's, it's one thing to give of my money. It's a whole other thing to ask me to suffer through being hungry for some period of time. You know, and I think it really comes, and this is coming from a cheapskate. You know, really, anytime you go to a restaurant, you're trading. Do I want to be hungry or do I want to have money? I'm one who would rather be hungry a lot of the times than give $20 so I can have a meal. So really, it's something that our society is built upon, this concept of I pay money and I get to eat instead of having to go hungry. But I think there's an element to not wanting to suffer for the case of Christ. Um, He says, Roger Foster says elsewhere, we have become so accustomed to cheap grace that we instinctively shy away from, from more demanding calls to obedience. So Richard thinks that maybe we've shied away from the concept of fasting because we've come to an understanding that God will hear our prayers regardless. So why do I need to suffer? Why do I need to go through the process of fasting if God's going to hear my request anyway? So I think we need to take a good hard look at Scripture and to determine whether or not we have a reason for us to look at fasting in our own lives. Let's start over in Ezra chapter 8. Ezra chapter 8. There is lots of material, just like Richard said, in this subject. And when I went through this this afternoon, I had about 40 minutes of material. So I took a chainsaw to it. So hopefully I cut this down so that we won't be here all evening. Ezra says, Then I proclaimed a fast there at the river of Ava, that we might humble ourselves before our God to seek him for a safe journey for us, our little ones, and all our possessions. For I was ashamed to request from the king troops and horsemen to protect us from the enemy on the way, because we had said to the king, The hand of our God is favorably disposed to all those who seek him, but his power and his anger are against those who forsake him. So we fasted, and we sought our God concerning this matter, and he listened to our entreaty. So Ezra, as they are getting ready to leave um, Babylonian captivity, he turns his attention towards God. All the assembly turns their attention towards God, and they spend a day in fasting and prayer, seeking God, seeking his favor, seeking his protection. Because they understood that they can't on one hand say, well, God protects us. And on the other hand say, but we need troops. They understood that they needed to go to God and seek his protection, his favor, and that God would protect them. So they used fasting as a way to use the body's reaction to the lack of food to remind them spiritually of the direction in life that they need to be having. They need to use that hunger to 
focus their attention towards spiritual matters. I think a lot of times when we fast, sometimes it's between um, breakfast and lunch, normally on a Sunday morning, normally when there's a potluck like next Sunday, and all we seem to be able to think about is filling our bellies. We sit here in worship and it's like, man, I wish that guy would get done sooner. See, instead of focusing upon the hunger in fasting, you focus upon the intent and the purpose of the fasting. And you use the body's natural um, reminders to say, hey, I need to be focusing on this thing. So there's a purpose for the fasting. That's one thing to note. The other thing to note is that it, it or so it's for a specific purpose. And it's for a set time, and it's for a sp- spiritual purpose. Um, the other thing that we can note is fasting can take place over different periods of time. So we have a 24-hour fast, what, like we have here in Ezra, and then we have a longer fast found in Second Samuel. In Second Samuel chapter 12, David is in the midst of despair because his child is going to die. And he is going to implore God to not let this child die. And the reason this child is going to be taken from him is because of his sin. Because of his rebellion against God's will. Look at what what David does. It's very interesting. David therefore inquired of the Lord for the child. And David fasted and went fasted and went and laid all night on the ground. The elders of his household stood beside him and ordered to raise him from the ground, but he was unwilling and would not eat food with them. Then it happened on the seventh day that the child died, and the servant of David's were afraid to tell him that the child was dead. For they said, Behold, while the child was still living, we spoke to him, and he did not listen to our voice. How then can we tell him the child is dead, since he might harm himself? But when David saw the servants, Whispering together, David perceived that the child was dead. So David said to his servants, is the child dead? And they said, he is dead. So David arose. He washed washed and anointed himself, changed his clothes, and he came into the house of the Lord, and he worshiped. And then he came to his own house, where he requested, and they set food before him, and he ate. Then his servants said to him, what is this that you have done? While the child was alive, you fasted, and you wept. But when the child was dead, you arose and you ate food. He said, when the child was still alive, I fasted and I wept. For I said, who knows? The Lord may be gracious to me that the child may live. But now he has died. Why should I fast? I cannot bring him back. I will go to him, but he will not return to me. David, in the midst of despair, knowing that God has pronounced a judgment upon him, seeks to use fasting along with mourning in order to show God his intent of his heart. He is sorrowful for his sin. He's repented of his sin. And he used fasting as a way to show the the fact that he is serious about his request. This isn't just something, oh yeah, and by the way, Lord, I want this. And oh yeah, by the way, it would be nice if I had that. He is intent upon this. And he goes seven days without food. Seeking God's will in this matter. Seeking God's um, intervention and change, to change God's mind. And God answers no. And David takes that answer and says, okay, if that's the answer, that's the answer. Richard Foster in his book uh, points out the difference between um, spiritual fasting and the world's version of fasting. Because I think we can read this story and we can get the mindset that... Fasting is a way of manipulating God. I'm going to fast, Lord, and you better answer my prayer. That wasn't David's intent, and I don't think it should be ours either. Listen to what Richard says here. Throughout Scripture, fasting refers to the abstaining from food for spiritual purposes. It stands in distinction to hunger strikes, the purpose of which is to gain political power or attain a good um, intention for a good cause. It is also distinct from health dieting, which stretches abstinence from food for physical, not spiritual purposes. Because of the um, secularization of our modern society, fasting, if it is done at all, 
is usually motivated either by vanity or a desire for power. That is not necessarily um, to say that these forms of fasting are wrong, but that their objections are different from fasting described in Scripture. Biblical fasting is always centered on a spiritual purpose. So David is using fasting as a way to seek God. He's using fasting as a way to come before God and to seek his will, to get him to see, I'm serious about this request. I am begging you, please do this thing. Please show me your direction for my life. The same thing that Ezra was showing when they were getting ready to set out. They were imploring God, please protect us. Please keep us safe. So it's going without a physical need in order to remind ourselves and to a to focus our mind upon a spiritual purpose. That's the focus of fasting. Now there's another kind of fasting found in scripture. And that's what's called total fasting. This is where you not only abstain from food. But you also abstain from all drink. Including water. Now I want to preface this. I'm not advocating this. If you fast for three days from water. You can die. Okay. I'm not recommending this. This is done in scripture. This is done within human means, I believe. Most of the times that we have an absolute fast, it's within three days. This is only used when you are desperately seeking God, desperately trying to figure out what's going on, and desperately seeking His will. I don't recommend this. Okay, I do not recommend this. But let's look at an example. Look over at Acts chapter 9. In Acts chapter 9, Saul has just had his world turned upside down. Listen to what is said. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were opened, he could see nothing. Leading him by the hand, they brought him into Damascus. And there for three days, without sight, he did not eat or drink. So for three days, Saul entered an absolute fast. Because Saul's had his world turned upside down. He thought Jesus was a fraud, and now Jesus shows up, resurrected, in all his glory, there on the road to Damascus. And now he's blind. So he's seeking God. He's seeking God's will. Now look at what happened when Ananias shows up. So Ananias departs and enters the house. And after laying his hands on him, says, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you were coming has sent me that you might regain your sight and be filled with the Spirit. Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he regained his sight. And he got up and he was baptized and then he ate and drank. So it was not until Saul got his answer. Till God answered him that he broke this fast. He just sought the Lord. He was going to be sustained by the Lord. And that was his direction. Like I said, I don't recommend this. But this is something that they did. You can also look back at Esther. And when Esther comes to the realization that she has to go before the king. She requests everybody in Israel to fast from water and food for three days and then she would go before the king and the king extended to her that scepter and she lived but these extreme fasts of absolute are also found for longer periods of time think of moses up on the mountain for 40 days without food or water he fasted while he received the law from god he was sustained supernaturally by god we can say the same thing about Elijah, who ran for 40 days through the desert, not eating or drinking anything after being sustained by the angel through the food and drink that he was given before he began the journey. So he was sustained as well, supernaturally. But we have another instance, and this isn't an absolute fast. This is just a long period fast by David or Daniel. Daniel, when he received one of these visions, did not eat or drink or did not eat for three weeks. He went three weeks without eating. He drank. But he did not eat. So for that time, until God sent a messenger and put his mind at ease, he did not um, eat for three weeks. Now, before you say, well, that one and Jesus um, fasting for 40 days in the wilderness, that was supernatural. Think again. In 1970 or in 1997, the British Medical Journal did a study on this. They wrote a paper. And in that paper, they found that it's not until about 35 to 40 days that the body enters what is known as starvation period. So you get through a certain period of time and your body says, hey, I'm hungry. You always feed me at noon. 
And it finally stops doing that. And eventually it says, hey, um, a little bit of sustenance, please. And after about, oh, 20 days or so, the body stops doing that. And it goes into a hibernation mode until about 35 days when it hits the end of its reserves. And it starts saying, hey, I'm starving here. I'm going to start eating your muscle. So you can live technically, depending on your body and and how you have uh, maintained it, for up to 61 days without food, scientifically. So that puts these kind of long fasts within our mere mortals' grasp. Father agrees with this, and when he describes um, the process of fasting that I kind of um, abbreviated there, he says, anywhere between 21 and 40 days or longer, depending on the individual, hunger pains will return. This is the first stage of starvation, and the pain signals that the body has used up its reserves and begins to draw on the living tissue. The fast should be broken at this time. So that is Richard's um, instruction as we look at these longer fasts. Now, not only do we have these long period fasts or these short fasts, not only do we kind of see the intent of why we fast, we also see that Israel had a schedule of fast that they did as a nation. By the time we get to Zechariah chapter 8, the nation of Israel had a number of fasts that they participated in. Here's what Zechariah 8, starting in verse 18, says. Then the word of the Lord of the host came to me, saying, Thus, you sh- thus says the Lord of hosts, The fast of the fourth, and the fast of the fifth, and the fast of the seventh, and the fast of the tenth months will become joy and gladness and cheerful feasts. For the house of Judah, so loved truth and peace. So Zechariah tells us that feasting was done by the nation of Israel on a regular basis. Sometimes every month, sometimes every other month, depending on these different feasts that would take place, there was a period of fasting that was associated with those. If we were to turn over to, I think it's Luke, um, there's that situation where Jesus is describing the the uh, Pharisee who's praying in the temple and the tax collector. And the Pharisee says, I fast twice a week. So by the time of the first century, the Jews had introduced a practice of the pious who would fast every week, twice a week. So for 24 hours, they would fast from food every week. They'd do it twice. So we see a, a, a standard practice there in fasting. But the other thing that we see here in um, this passage is that fasting should be a joyous thing. It's not gloom. It's not sorrow. We fast in celebration, focusing upon God. It's not, oh, I can't eat. But it's, I'm not eating because I'm seeking God. I want to know God. I want to hear from God. I want to pour my heart out towards God. I need his counsel. I need his guidance. I need his protection. That's what we see of fasting. Now, here's the question that often gets asked. Should Christians fast? We've looked at a lot of Old Testament examples. We know that the New Testament talks about it a little bit, but should Christians fast? And if you start researching this, what you'll find is a lot of times the question is worded this way. Is there a command that Christians must fast? Is there a command that Christians must fast? And I have an issue with the wording of that. Because it says, well, can I get out of it? That's the intent of that question. Is there a command that I have to? I'm looking for a way out by definition. And the simple answer to that question is no. There's not a command that a Christian must fast. But I think that's the wrong question. Are Christians supposed to fast? Is it something that God is expecting us as Christians to do? I think that is a better question to ask. So let's begin to look through some of the pages of the New Testament to see if we as Christians are commanded to fast. If this concept of that we've seen in the Old Testament is something we should bring across the bridge, as it were, to our Christian lives today. Look over at Matthew chapter 9. We'll let Jesus answer this question for us. Jesus addressing uh, John's disciples, starting in verse 14, we read this. Then the disciples of John came to him, asking, Why do the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? Jesus said to them, The attendant of the bridegroom cannot mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them, can they? 
But the day will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and they will fast. But no one puts a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch will pull away from the garment, and the worst tear will result. Nor will people put new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the wineskins will burst. The wine will run out, and the wineskins will be ruined. But no, they pour new wine into fresh wineskins, and both are preserved. I think part of the reason we wrestle with this question of should Christians fast when we look at this is Jesus answers in a riddle. I think it's a simple riddle, but he answers in a riddle, and it takes some thought to really unpack what Jesus is intending here. He starts off with this picture of a wedding feast. He says, I want you to think about a wedding feast. In a wedding, do those who are there celebrating the bride and groom fast? Or do they rejoice? Do they celebrate? Jesus says, my disciples, this is what he's saying, my disciples, they're with me. I'm the bridegroom. We're together. Yeah, we're celebrating. Yeah, we're not participating in the twice a week fast that the Pharisees are participating in. Of course we're not. I'm, I'm here. Why would they fast? Why would they mourn? But he says there's coming a time when they will fast. When I leave, they will fast. He doesn't say, and they must fast. But yeah, they'll, they'll fast. And then he goes on to explain his answer. He says, I want you to think about a garment. You don't sew a patch of new cloth on an old garment because that new patch will shrink and it's going to pull away from the old garment and it'll make the tear worse. So you don't just take the old thing and you just slap it on the new or vice versa. You don't take the old and patch it with the new. You don't just apply the one and put it on the other. That doesn't work. He then ex- expounds upon that. He says, I want you to think about the concept of wineskins. When you take grape juice and you pour it in this um, leather bag, as the grape juice just naturally ferments, it's going to expand. There's going to be um, gases that are released as it's kept and, and stored until it's used. And that's going to stretch the leather. And after that's gone, if you pour new grape juice into that wineskin, those gases will expand again and it's going to burst that leather. And you're going to lose the wineskin for any sort of water carrying purposes and you're going to lose the new grape juice he says no what you do is you pour the new wine into new wine skins and both are preserved so i think there's an expectation by jesus that we will fast as christians i don't know that he wants us to fast every week i don't think he's looking for us to fast on a regular basis necessarily but there's an expectation of jesus that yeah just like the jews used to fast for purposes, for a specific reason, so too we would fast. So to us as Christ followers, we would seek to fast. Jesus even gives examples and in addresses how we are to fast. Look over at Matthew chapter 6. And in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus says, Whenever you fast, do not put on gloomy faces like hypocrites do, for they neglect their appearance, so that they will be noticed by men when they are fasting. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward in full. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face so that your fasting will be noticed, will not be noticed by men, but by your father who is in secret and your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. So Jesus says the point of fasting is not to look glum, not to be just disheartened. It's not to be seen by men. It's not to show off. Oh, yeah, I'm fasting, right? The, the way the Pharisees do it is, oh, I'm fasting. It's for God. You know, and they were just drawing attention to themselves. Jesus says, you're not supposed to do that. Fast, but that's between you and God. So fasting is an inward discipline. It's an inward discipline of a lack of an outward thing. I'm abstaining, I'm abstaining from an outward action, which is to focus inwardly. And when my body says, hey, you need to eat, I'm reminded, I need to pray. I need to seek God about this. I'm fasting for this reason. I'm going to seek God about this. There's one more passage that we can look on on the issue of fasting, and that is Acts chapter 13. And in Acts chapter 13, we have an example of what the early church would do as a part of their worship. Starting in verse 1. Now, we were at Antioch in the church that was there, and the prophets and the teachers, Barnabas and Simon, who was called Nigger, And Lycus, 
of Cyrene, the Madden, who had been brought up with Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were ministering, um, ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called them. Then, when they had fasted and prayed, they laid their hands upon them and they sent them away. And this is the beginning of the first missionary journey, of Paul beginning his first missionary journey. So the church had this time that they had set aside and they were going to fast and pray and they were going to worship God and they were going to set that aside. And during that time, the Holy Spirit spoke to them and said, hey, you need to set these guys aside. You need to send them out. They need to do some mission work. So that's the example that we have in Scripture. Now, I'm not saying that the Holy Spirit is going to speak to you when you fast and tell you, hey, you need to go do mission work or someone needs to go do this thing. That was during that time period. But I think the example of fasting as a part of worship, as a part of seeking God, is something that we need to take note of. That being said, I think we should seek, if we can, to add fasting to our repertoire of tools that we can use to seek God, to bring us closer to God. But before you jump down that rabbit hole, I need to give you a warning. Fasting is not for everybody. Like I said, we're not commanded as Christians to do this, and some of us can't. And that's okay. There's a long list up here of medical reasons that I found online of reasons why you should not fast. Now, if you have one of these, that doesn't mean you can't. It means you need to go talk to your doctor about how you can fast. What are your limitations? If you have blood sugar issues, you definitely need to figure out how you're going to manage no food and the blood sugar, right? That's just a no-brainer. Let me give you some tips, though, of how you can fast. One is called a juice fast, juice fast. So instead of eating solid foods, you simply drink juice and that provides you that nourishment. Your body's still going to go, hey, uh, hamburger, please. But you can put that aside. You can focus upon fasting. You can have that nourishment from your vegetables in a pureed form and you can fast that way. And that's a good way to begin fasting. Another good way to begin fasting is to do a 20 or a 12 hour fast first. So get up, eat breakfast, notice the time. 12 hours later, that's the last meal you or bite of food you can have for the day. Then you fast for that night. That's not a religious fast, but it's preparing your body to fast. That makes sense? You're trying to get your body used to this concept of I can go without food for a little bit. After all, that's why it's called break fast, breakfast. We fast every day. Right, the body's designed to fast, so and it's a good thing. There, there's lots of health benefits to it. Um, so start off with a 12-hour fast, work up to a 24-hour fast where you eat one meal a day. Um, utilize juices as a way to uh, help your body to do this. I rode my bike one day, and then I decided I'm going to fast that day, and I'm like, well, I just used a lot of energy, so I drank some juice th- throughout the day because my body wasn't going to have it. Right, so. That's one way that you can begin that. The other thing you need to do when fasting is drink lots of water. Stay hydrated. Like I said, I do not recommend a complete fast. Not from water anyway. So drink lots of liquids, lots of H2O as you do that. Another great thing that you can do, regardless of the length of your fast, as you work up to a longer fast, um, break it with juices, break it with vegetables. Make sure you're eating healthy foods on either side of a fast. It really just helps that transition.